Good evening everyone and welcome back to another wonderful event with Cycling UK launching a new long distance trail. Now first things first, I would like to find out how many of you watching tonight have actually already ridden one of Cycling UK's trails. So you can go into the side comments there, um, you can click on comments and you can just type in there and let us know if you've been on any of the trails so far, what you think of them, maybe even what you'd like to see another time. I'd like to know where you're watching from and things like that. It's a live event, it's public, it's friendly, so let's all get involved and have a chat. So tonight, as I say, it's all about a long distance trail. It's been brought to you by Cycling UK, who are a charity, by uh, the Experience Project and by their campaigns team. So we're going to go into experience a little bit later on. But campaigns, you might be wondering, what's campaigning got to do with a wonderful, exciting new adventure trail? So let me tell you that Cycling UK have been opening access to the countryside since, nine, uh, since 1888. Sorry. Um, in 1888, they got cyclists recognised as carriages for the right to use the roads. And that was just the start of what Cycling UK have been doing to make sure that the whole of the UK has access or cyclists have access to the land in whichever form it is. So in 1968, they secured the right to cycle on bridleways and long distance cross country routes. And that was incorporated into the Countryside Act. And in 2003, they secured open access for cycling in the Scottish um, Land Reform Act. Now, everyone who's in England and Wales, we are very jealous of how much access Scottish people have on bikes. And it does tend to make us travel that little bit further north because of it. And we really do hope that England and Wales and Northern Ireland will follow in the footsteps very, very soon. Um, so they've linked together four long distance off-road cycling routes since 2018. Uh, the North Downs Way, uh, the Great North Trail, that was a hugely, hugely popular launch. You might remember that. And hopefully some of you have done that one already. We know that thousands and thousands of people have taken on that route. So um, if you're one of those people, I see in the... Um, in the comments, some people are saying that they have ridden or the, the route that Cycling UK launched last summer, which was King Alfred's Way, which is a very hugely historical route in the west of England. And tonight we're going to be talking about the West Kernow Way. So this is the most south and the most west trail that Cycling UK have launched so far. Um, if you'd like to support the work that Cycling UK do, why not become a member today? And we're going to pop something in the chat, so we'll put it down on the screen as well and a link in the chat and um, so you can just click and have a look at what becoming a member entails obviously it supports some of the wonderful work that cycling uk does if you're a keen off-roader which i'm sure many of you watching tonight are um your money your membership will go towards funding routes like this as well as those campaign asks that i've just talked about opening up the cam uh, the countryside and just showing politicians and landowners how absurd some of the laws are um, but also you get personal benefits as well uh, you get insurance and discounts little cheeky discounts in the cycling trade so do go check it out Without further ado, let's get a video on the screen which is going to give a little insight into the trail that we're talking about today, which is the West Kerno Way.
Nice one, thank you. And we're going to get Sophie Gordon on the screen. Hey, Sophie. And I want to say hello to a few other people who are getting involved in the chat as well. We've got um, Bishop, and he hasn't actually ridden the route yet, but is watching from Cornwall this evening. So I'm sure you're going to be telling him exactly why he needs to be getting on this bike and riding it. Um, and people as well from London, Surrey, and somebody even watching from Lebanon. So uh, hopefully you can convince some people that it's worth the trip down to go ride this trail and Sophie you really are the best person to give a little bit of a background about the creation of this trail so obviously you're from Cycling UK what's your role there? Um, I work in the campaigns team focusing on off-road access so a big range of everything from kind of family-friendly disused railway lines through to mountain biking and epic long distance routes so it's a great variation. And how did the West Kerno Way come about? Uh, well, we kind of got the idea we, after King Albert's Way, that was really exciting. We were thinking, oh, where should we go next for another long distance trail? And then um, Cycling UK is currently working on an EU funded experience project, which is based on encouraging sustainable year round tourism activities in Cornwall, Norfolk and Kent. So we thought, well, that seems quite a good idea to start with one of those as a focus. Um, and Cornwall just kind of stood out as, as the first one so that was the inspiration and then we started looking at the maps and seeing how we could piece it all together and and how do you piece a trail like this together you know you've talked about it a little bit for before with some of the other trails so maybe i mean did uh, west kerno way pose any differences and even for those who have never heard the story before how do you go from an idea to actually creating those routes yeah it's difficult <laughs> um <laughs> uh, it's worth pointing out there are kind of there aren't any diggers or bulldozers or any concrete laying in, involved in any of this. It's not kind of building something. It's more about joining up the paths and trails and lanes that already exist. But the challenge that we had in Cornwall was there are a lot of footpaths and there aren't a lot of bridleways and byways. So if you're trying to create an off-road route, it makes it really challenging to try and find the parts that you can link together. Yeah. And you want to highlight some of you know, the reasons you know, we're saying it in the introduction there, your work in campaigns is more than just creating lovely routes. It's about highlighting. So can you just explain a little bit more about what and why and how you're trying to shine a spotlight on? Definitely. Well, I mean, the first thing is showing the economic benefits of cycle tourism, which we've really seen with King Alfred's Way, the amount of people that are going off and doing it. And we've got B&B owners saying, oh, blimey, about half our customers were cyclists last summer. And, you know, all these <laughs> crazy things like that. And they've started installing bike racks to cater for the demand. And that's just brilliant, you know, keeping all these little cafes going. Um, but then, mm. yes, the other thing is making the case for off-road access. It's kind of linking those two together and showing the benefits of it. And so for the West Kerno Way, because it was such a challenge to link things together, we kind of had to put our creative thinking caps on and do a little bit of research because as an average across England, only 22% of right, the rights of way network is open to cyclists, which makes it really difficult to link up. And in Cornwall, that's even lower. I don't know the figure off the top of my head. So, but we found out that we're kind of making use of what we've been calling lost ways which are historic mm. rights of way that used to be, you know, highways and roads across moors and open landscapes used by traders and people heading off on horseback to, you know, go to the nearby town. Um, but since then, they've kind of been slowly disappeared off the maps or they've been recorded as a footpath, even though they would have been quite an important road. Um, so by kind of digging into the archives and doing some research with historic maps, we can start to say, oh, hang on a bit. It, there's a lot of evidence that indicates that this shouldn't actually be a footpath. It should have a higher status and you should be able to cycle and ride a horse and drive a carriage on it because this historic right has always been there. It hasn't gone away. So for a few short sections to link things together, we've kind of yeah pulled out some of the lost ways and done the research and found the maps and said, well, yeah, actually, on the balance of evidence, we think there are existing rights to cycle on this. So we're going to include this section to link things together. Yeah, because I saw some of that in the promotional talk about the way, you know, these lost ways, and it does sound um, rather mythical, but it can actually be uh, become something very solid and it can get changed in law. And um, I think one of your colleagues was explaining to me that people can highlight lost ways and this can, in time, get officially changed to bridal way 
and cycle access status. Am I right? Yes. About that? Yeah, definitely. So I won't go too into the technical jargon, but there's a thing called a definitive map modification order, which you can apply for. Um, so you kind of, you know, go into all these archives and get your stacks of old maps, um, which so one example that we've done is there's a section called, which is now known as the Tinner's Way, which used to be an old road between St. Just and St. Ives. And, you know, you look at it and it's this big, wide gravel track that's clearly been a significant route for millennia. There's evidence of it going back to the Bronze Age, people using it. So we kind of dug back into all these maps and there's one from, I think it was 1699 that has it shown as a big, bold line connecting these two places. And then it's so interesting because you know, some of the other older maps, it's very clear. And then as you look towards the more recent maps, it gets a bit more higgledy-piggledy. There's a bit that's a footpath, the bit that's not quite clear what it is. So you can say, well, actually, submitting all these together, you can see this was an important route, and therefore you can ask the council to upgrade it. The problem is that they've got a huge backlog of applications to deal with, so it could take up to 15 years to get through all of them, which is why we thought, well, we can't sit around waiting for all of these to be approved you know where the evidence is strong and we think yeah it's suitable for lots of people to cycle on it then we've kind of included it on the route and submitted the applications well i think that's an absolutely fair shout and so you're there um dusting away these old maps linking together routes where at what point does that what you're looking at on a piece of paper or on a screen then become checked out in reality and made clear that this is a physical route well, yeah, it's, it's kind of magical always when that happens. I spend so long looking at like little sections of the map and then you go and see it in real life. Um, so, yeah, I was really lucky to go and test ride the route a few months ago with some wonderful other people that are going to appear and chat to us in a bit. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's always a really useful thing to do because sometimes we still have a couple of options where we're not quite sure. We had a bit of that around the Lizard Peninsula where we thought, oh, this route looks really nice, but this route could also work and we need to see which one's best. So, yeah, test riding it in reality is, is definitely an essential step. And then there's so much more to it than just that as well. It's like bringing the whole thing to life. It goes from, I don't know, a drawing on a screen to, to actually riding it and then finding out stories about the places, local businesses and, um, and turning that into a fully guided or guidable route. Um, and which is why we're going to bring Guy Kesteven onto the screen now, because he is the guy behind the guide. <laughs> Hey guy. And Hi everybody. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, Sophie, we're just going to say goodbye for a minute. We're gonna have you on to chat about the route in a little while. Um, and we're gonna really pick your brains here, Guy, um, because you've really gone into the nitty gritty of this route. And I think you can share with people um, just how special it is. So what were your expectations before you went out and write, rode it? Because you've written lots of these sorts of things. Yeah, I think my well, number one expectation was every you talk to anyone about Cornwall and they will say how incredibly busy it is and it's really crowded and you wouldn't get I didn't think I'd get any peace and quiet there. And I was utterly gobsmacked by how kind of remote and wild and just beautifully sort of isolated and remote most of the route is. I mean, I rode it in June and I mean, yeah, the G7 summit was on at the time but the interior it goes to these kind of benchmark points like the lizard like land's end and places people have heard of it's the sections in between it's these sort of innumerable little stream crossings wooded valleys beaches coves that don't even have names these amazing coastal cliff paths that you just have all to yourself and that's you know obviously that's the thing that a bike can bring you that utter close involvement with the nature. I know Catherine's been talking about the bird life and stuff like that, but it's such an immersive and just beautiful remote and wild experience. And that's what I wasn't expecting. And I think um, so many people are watching this because it is that sort of adventure route. It may be a little bit more challenging or a little bit more isolated in some places. Um, Oh, you've got someone going up the stairs. So, so what's it, I mean, to use just a generic concept, what's it like? What is the route like? I always find that when I go to Cornwall, it feels like I'm going to a completely different country. Yes, yeah, Cornwall is unique. Uh, yes, it obviously has very similarities with other parts of the Atlantic coast, 
uh, both you know in Brittany and places like that, and up Scotland and Wales. But it really has a very, very unique atmosphere. You know, the Cornish don't see themselves as part of England, and that and that almost kind of breathes out of the landscape as well. It has this incredible history and a really proud history, whether it's the prehistory, whether it's the mining history. I mean, in several phases of its existence, it's been the absolute white hot center of technological innovation, whether that's steam engine and mining, or whether it's the place they were mining tin in the very in the late Neolithic and very early Bronze Age. I mean, people were coming from all over the Mediterranean. Phoenician traders were coming over in the you know in the prehistoric period to get tin from you know they were talking about Marazion, they were talking about St Michael's Mount in Herodotus and things like that. You know, famous Greek historians. There's there's a possibility Jesus even came to uh, one of the mines with Joseph of Arimathea. That's one of the legends that's gone about. And everywhere you go in Cornwall, there is amazing stories and legends and a landscape that just vib utterly vibrates with that kind of history and intrigue and mystery. It really is somewhere very, very special. And how can you find out about that history if you're just a lone rider on your bike doing the West Kerno Way? Is this something that, you know, you've got all those stories in the guidebook? Or do yeah. you get as well by being there, actually these stories come to you because you're getting involved in it? Well, obviously, you know, you won't necessarily know the details of the stories, but if you yeah. stand by Morfra Coit, whether it's a beautiful sunny day with skylarks or you're up on there on this misty moorland with like these skeins of fog sort of drifting past you, it is so evocative, so atmospheric. You can't help but feel you know, that history all around you. And it's the same when you're seeing the tin mines and engine houses coming out of the mist on the North Atlantic coast or, you know, these tiny little coves with the Church of the Storms and everywhere, you know, and all the uh, underground little chambers they have in Cornwall as well. You know, it's a specific form of uh, fugu, they call it. It's, and nobody really knows what they are. There's so much mystery still, you know, and just... This, it's such an incredible place. And one fact I found out, I mean, a lot of this is, I've tried to, you know, I've tried to illustrate this in the guidebook, a lot of this background information. So, you know, do read the guidebook and uh, get the information from there. But also there are so many things you can deep dive into in terms of, you know, I went, I, I lost myself so many times researching the guidebook. And also I like to point out that, you know, it wasn't me creating the route. That's been done by Sophie and Duncan and particularly Kieran Foster in the team at Cycling UK. You know, those are the guys. I just come in at the end, I did a recce ride, and I'm kind of the, I don't know, court jester or, you know, balladeer, whatever. I'm, I'm the person who's lucky enough to be able to take their work, whether it's buying tide maps in the medieval period or, fight, you know, fighting for route access, negotiating it with various people. And I'm lucky enough to be able to try and bring that alive on the page. And it's a real honor to be involved in projects like this especially after seeing how successful the West Kern, the King Alfred's Way was and to see the reaction to West Kernow Way already. Yeah, well, that's what I think so brilliant about events like this as well. It allows the public to really realise what goes on in creating one of these routes. You know, hopefully thousands of people will just see the route, think, oh, I fancy giving that a go and they'll ride it because that's the ultimate goal. But I think there's also something wonderful in, and these routes do seem to be creating community as well in people realising the whole bigger picture there is around just these signposted routes and, and the, you know, the campaign arts that I've gone on about, the joining together of the maps, the creating the stories. Um, you know, it is, it's, it's a beautiful world and it's an undertaking with so many people that creates a whole sphere around what's well, essentially a bike route. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, I've written yeah. my own version. Sorry, I've written my own version of the story, but the ultimate purpose of this route is for everyone else to write their own stories. I guess, mm. I mean, it's quite a glib thing to say, but that's what you're creating. You're creating your own memories, your own history. You're drawing on those elements that you want to take in and you're making something special for yourself. And did you see what happened with um, the King Alfred's Way? So the, the trail that was launched last summer uh, before this route, Guy also wrote the um, the guidebook for that. Did you then see, I guess you may have been following the Facebook groups or hear about friends and friends of friends, people telling you stories that have come out of it beyond what you first put down? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, I mean, there's so you know whether whether you know there's people doing these incredible athletic feats, racing around it in 17 hours or something, or there's people doing it on an e cargo bike with their dog. I think that was one of my favourite videos that came up from uh, King Alfred's Way, and you know, there's it's lovely to be able to dip into that Facebook resource and to see so many different approaches to it. You know, some people are first time riders. I think it's worth pointing out for the West Kernel Way. It is quite challenging in terms of gradient, and there are some sections where even a fit rider will probably have to push. And there are some sections of footpath as well because of the uh, Lost Ways project. There are some sections which we'd like you to push. I mean, again, that's all elucidated in the guidebook where those are. But you know, it has a slight. I'd say it has a slightly higher level of challenge. Also, there's a bit more commitment in going right down to the sock end of England. Or sorry, Gormal isn't in part of England. I kept getting told off for that. You're not allowed to say that. Uh, but. Yeah, it's, there's a little more kind of challenge to it. You know, you can go for quite a long period without finding food if you miss, you know, if you're going around the Tinner's Way and sections like that. But there's so many diverse aspects to it, from the coastal paths to these tiny back lanes or to, you know, the mining trails around Red Roof. I think that's one thing I'd like to say. Uh, a lot of people, I think, go, oh, mining trails around Red Roof. I'll just it's an easy point to nip off and obviously if you're running short on time or you've got other reasons not to do it they might not do it but it's a fantastic section of the route again a totally different uh vibe and experience to the prehistoric areas but places like goon gumpus and you know the mining areas there at one point in that small valley there were more steam engines working there than there were in the whole of western europe and all the americas combined in an area of five square miles in cornwall you know, it really was the Silicon Valley of its time in the uh, 1800s. Incredible. I bet everyone loves taking you to the pub quiz these days, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if Cornwall or West Coast, well, or, uh, yeah, King Alfred comes up, I'm pretty much on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have to ask you as well, because we will bring bringing on the screen in a minute some really fantastic cyclists who have got a history and background in adventure cycling about bikes because everyone always wants to know what sort of bike is best for these kinds of trails now everyone's going to have a slightly different opinion but i know that you are a bike testing geek as well you love this stuff so we can't let you go without knowing what you think would be you know the ideal bike for the job for the west kerno way uh i think you should match it to your confidence levels uh if okay. you're fine comfortable riding gravel bike off-road ride that if you're in any doubt go for the most capable bike you've got so if you've got a gravel bike and a mountain bike and you're not sure go with a mountain bike it'll be a little bit slower on the road but you'll be able to ride more of it uh, definitely not a road bike uh, possibly a touring bike with wider tires but you will push some sections but whatever bike you've got uh, make sure it's well maintained tighten all the bolts up on it definitely because there are some rattly sections and if you've not ridden off-road before, or you've not ridden a long way off-road before, even if you're a demon on Zwift, or you can knock out 150k on the road without thinking about it, it is a very, very different thing to ride off-road, especially on successive days. Mm. Fantastic. Um, so I just do a bit of groundwork, you know, help yourself out. I'm, ramb I'm rambling on. You, you did say I was a bike testing geek, so. But <laughs> No, well, we definitely had to ask you that question, and it was it was a really good in-depth answer, so I appreciate that. But I just also wanted to quickly ask you about um, places to stop, places to eat. You said that it is possible to get maybe a little bit caught out on this route, um, but we also know that these routes are bringing tourism to local businesses, so what's available for people um, on the West Kono Way? There is all sorts, if you're smart enough. Sorry, I'm, I'm under the stairs in a hotel. Uh, I've been riding up in Peebles and Tweed Valley. Uh, You're such so a gravel biker. Background noise. But what I would say is take every opportunity to eat. So I think it should be a byword for all cyclists anyway. But the route deliberately avoids some central areas. So there are some areas of the route where you'll kind of, you'll skirt the outskirts of St. Just or you won't quite go into St. Ives or St. Earth. If you're peckish, Go into St. Just. There's some incredible pasty shops. There's one of the early pasty shops in Cornwall. And, you know, again, if you're peckish, go into St. Ives. Just don't be afraid to divert slightly off the route because, because you know, the whole idea is to have a wilderness experience, is to keep you out of sort of centres of population and to keep you on minimal traffic roads and trails. 
So by the very nature of that, that might not take you right past the door of the pasty shop, but it's usually common sense. You know, my big mistake <laughs> was not getting a pasty in St. Just and then riding all the way to Coverack 70 kilometers later before I finally found my pasty. Yeah, don't do that. Not recommended. I was hungry. But if you do do that, there's so much food to eat in Coverack. You know, you'll be more than able to uh, catch up there. And I know uh, Sophie has a particular uh, fondness for the slice of Cornwall near uh, Constantine. <laughs> Great. So we're getting right down to the nitty gritty of where exactly you can stop. And if anyone would like to find out all those sorts of details, like I say, Guy is the wealth of knowledge and he's written it all down in the Root Guidebook. So um, there should be a link right down here. And also you can click in the comments as well, click through to buying your guidebook. So thank you so much, Guy. Really, really appreciate that. And we're going to get the recce routing team onto the screen now. We're going to start one at a time. Um, so let's get Catherine on joining us. Um, Hiya. Hiya, how are you doing? Good. So, I'm feeling quite uh, nostalgic talking about it now. Because it's oh, back in July, I think, which seems like ages ago when we went and did our recce. Well, it, it looked like you had the most amazing time. And obviously doing it as a group as well, it must be really lovely to come and share some memories together again as well. Um, but as individual riders, solo riders in your own right, each one of you has achieved some pretty impressive things as bike adventurers, as it were. So if you'd just give us a little bit of a resume of who you are, and especially emphasizing those solo <laughs> adventures that you've done. Well, I don't know about solo. I enjoy the uh, the group riding aspect. I was really, sorry, I'm Catherine. Hi, I'm a cycling <laughs> journalist and a bit of a map nerd as well. So this is right up my street. Um, I was really lucky to join Sophie and Sam from Cycling UK on the King Alfred's Way recce last year, um, which was absolutely fantastic. So I was really delighted to be invited back again to see the West Kerno Way for the first time. Um, I really love traveling in the UK. Um, I think we've got so many incredible roads and off-road uh, tracks to explore so this kind of thing really excites me um i think apart from the king alfred way and the west kerno way uh, i've done the second city divide which links glasgow and manchester which is a really phenomenal route um yeah i can't say i've done anything much bigger than that yet but um these sorts of weekender or long weekend routes I think are just so brilliant and accessible and really help to showcase that we've got such amazing riding in the UK. So yeah, I'm 100% behind it. Yeah, because I know, so I know that you've done some of these adventure routes abroad as well, but I do think, do you think with COVID as well, a lot more people are starting to come around to your way of thinking that actually we can just holiday on the doorstep and there's so much to discover. Definitely, yeah. It's just yeah. incredible the amount of stuff that you can find and you really don't have to go so far. I'm really lucky to be based in Bristol. So we've got the whole of Wales on our doorstep, the Southwest, um, the Cotswolds, Mendips, everything. And I think the more that people are getting into more self-sufficient riding where you can pitch up and pretty much leap anywhere, um, the more accessible it is for people. Because I know this year when I was thinking about my holiday in August, uh, it was too stressful to me for me to try and book anywhere uh, like an Airbnb or a mm. guest house or anything. So we just went to Dartmoor because we knew we could wild camp legally and um, just sort of ramble around and have a bit of fun. Um, so I think, yeah, it's just becoming easier and easier for people to travel around the UK. Yeah. And so often it is just about that accessibility as these routes are say, showing as, you know, your experience on Dartmoor shows. If it's there and if it's available, people will use it and they want to. Um, somebody else who is a bit of queen of solo riding is Vidangi. Um, I was attempted to introduce you there, but actually I'd like to hear, you know, the words from your own mouth. Who are you and what are some of your achievements in long distance cycling? So... I'm Vidangi. Um, uh, achievement is a very big word, uh, but some stuff that I've done was like um, I've ridden my bike across Himalayas, uh, Indian Himalayas. So it's like a 
like 800 odd kilometer on an off-road route that goes across some really high mountain passes and yeah in 2018 I rode my bike around the world so that was like a 29,000 kilometer route it was all on road but it was nowhere close to kind of you know as cool as probably West Kona way and most cycling UK routes are to be fair like that when they launch new routes I usually like yeah don't tell anyone take off from work and just you know <laughs> go and ride them um but yeah like some of this that's kind of the stuff that I've done before so um and yeah like one of the first things I did when I moved to the UK back in 2016 was um riding my bike across the country to understand the country more the culture better and I didn't know what bikepacking was so I was basically just carrying a backpack and I had a saddlebag and I was just like knocking on random people's doors and or like just sleeping under bus shelters uh yeah didn't even have like a sleeping mat or a sleeping bag or anything so yeah like that's that's the kind of that, that was like how I started but yeah that's that's more the stuff that I've done before I suppose it's throwing yourself in the deep end with adventure I love that you're like oh achievement is a big word but some of the stuff I've done is that I was you know just like the youngest woman to cycle around the world yeah okay we'll casually drop that in so as you can see audience we have got a very experienced um adventurer with us and i can't wait to hear about your experience of the uh, west kerno way um i just want to see here that like Kortos, um i hope i've said that right has said that they agree with you catherine what we were talking about earlier that we're very fortunate to live in the uk with the numerous adventure cycle routes available to us and i, I you know i've got to say i do think that cycling uk are, should be able to give themselves a pat on the back for for being able the uk being able to have that perception and vision of itself now um, you know, numerous adventure cycle routes. That's something to be very proud of. So thanks for that comment. Um, okay, and we're going to get Rob onto the screen now as well. Another part of the fab, fab, fantastic route riders. Hey, Rob. <laughs> hey. So, hey, how are you as a, as a cyclist and adventure rider? Um, uh, I, I missed that, Anna. Sorry, what was the question? I was away. <laughs> who are you? Oh, who are you? Yeah. So my name's Rob Penn, and I'm a journalist and an author and a broadcaster, and I've been on a bike um, a long time now. Uh, got a mountain bike and started exploring the back Black Mountains in uh, about 1991, and. Um, God, I rode a bike around the world in the late 90s, rode a bike over the Karakorams and through the Hindu Kush in the early 90s, didn't bump into Vidangi. Um, um, and I've been exploring Britain on kind of every form of, you know, starting with rigid mountain bikes and then hardtails and uh, now um, gravel bike. And I rode King Alfred's Way last year and wrote a piece in The Guardian about that. I thought that was a totally fantastic route. Um, I mean, I remember coming across Cycling UK in their former iteration. It was basically where you went to get maps. So when I was trying to ride a bike from Kashgar to Peshawar in uh, the kind of early 90s, I, I ended up, you know, peering into a filing cabinet at Cycling UK's head office just outside Godalming to try and find some route notes on it. And I found some. So, so I'm deeply in, de in debt to Cycling UK. I mean, for really inspiring many, many of the adventures that I've undertaken over the years. I love this group that just makes cycling around the world sound like such an average thing to do. Um, but like, you know, Cycling UK, I think, really have pulled together a phenomenal group to do that recce ride. Um, and so how did you guys end up gelling as a team? Obviously, you know, you've been pulled together for, for your different experiences um, in cycling that, you know, you know how to do this stuff. You know how to deal with any challenges that you might come up against. But obviously, you'd have to then ride together as a team and deal with those challenges together was it fun uh, hand up who wants to go first uh, yeah i'll go it was really great fun i mean by the kind of very nature of being a cycling journalist you know it's interesting to hear what catherine says but you do spend a lot of time riding on your own right and 
you know, because you ride probably more than two days a week and not everybody can, you know, get off work and come with you. So you do spend a lot of time riding on your own. Uh, but I don't fear riding with other people. In fact, I really, really enjoyed it. And, you know, and sort of Catherine was our kind of pub meister. You know, she was totally intolerant when, you know, when she felt like a pint, she just said, we're going to have a pint. <laughs> and, and, and that was brilliant, you know. There was our, you know, I'd willingly just go on sweating away down the road joyless you know at the end of the day but no Catherine said we're going for a pint we all went for a pint it's brilliant and for Dang, it was brilliant as well so she's like i'm hungry we're stopping great <laughs> <laughs> um, you know you do end up riding with lots of people who who just don't know when to stop but fortunately as a team we did we had a great time because of that yeah anyone else want to expand on that i think we had a really good setup because we all met in Penzance the night before we were going to be doing the ride so we had a, a chance to get to know each other a bit over the world's biggest fish and chip order that you've ever seen <laughs> we had just stacks and stacks of fish and fritters and chips and of course being cordial we had to try some of the local rattler uh, cider and soft drinks were also available of course but uh, <laughs> yeah I don't know. I think it's a great way to get to know people doing these sorts of things. Um, mm -hmm. I've made loads of friends over the years doing these sorts of bike rides, whether you're doing it as part of an organised event and they're doing the same route, or if it's just somebody that happens to be there. Um, and I think you bond so deeply with people when you're on the bike because I was having this conversation with someone because you don't have to directly look at them in the eyes. I think you end up revealing a lot more than you would perhaps to other people and people see you at your lowest points as rob said but also we all just had a total giggle over the bikes that we were riding um oh. i certainly did um so okay i think that leads perfectly to that question then what bikes were you riding and why and were they the right choice um, Vadangi. Uh, we were riding specialised e-bikes and as someone who has never ridden an e-bike before that was absolute luxury. Actually even anyone who has ever ridden an e-bike would say that but it was it was incredible like on all the steep hills just kind of finding that right button and pressing it and you know you're just magically going up this hill and you almost it, it feels like you're having a bit of a tailwind if you're in an eco mode that's literally how i would describe it and yeah like the second mode what was it catherine was it a uh, trail mode the level in between two. yeah <laughs> yeah that was insane it was like when when you feel like actually tired not even like you don't want that tailwind you just want to get up the hill then you would probably use that and um, turbo mode was something i actually didn't try and i regret it like i i know um i know jordan was saying that he really enjoyed turbo mode but i actually didn't get to try it but having e-bikes on that route was something special <laughs> and something we all enjoyed a lot and it's always such a debate on these sorts of routes, you know, e-bike or not e-bike. Is it cheating? Uh, does it make it more enjoyable? So this is definitely, again, one that I want to open up to the public. would love to know anyone who's thinking about riding it on an e-bike. Or have you done any of the other trails on an e-bike? Uh, better or worse, do let us know. Um, any other pros and cons about the bikes that you were on um, that you can part, you know, thinking about it from an advice point of view to the audience watching? Um, not just about the motor, but about the other aspects of the bike. Uh, Rob? Uh, I'm, I'm sure Kat, Kat, uh, Catherine's got some, something more intelligent to say than me, but, but I, I mean, I, it was really my first e-bike experience. And you know, apart from, you know, having a quick scoot up the hill from the, you know, local pub on one of my friends' e-bikes, e e-mountain bikes. So my first experience on a gravel bike, my first multi-day tour on a bike. And I have to say, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, you, know, I, you know, if you told me that I had to go tomorrow to ride the West Kano Way on a, you know, straight gravel bike, I, that would be totally great too. But, it, you know, it just makes the kind of difference, you know, I'm getting old, you know, and those 20 percenters getting out of those, you know, coves on the, 
I'm around the lizard. Do you know they really take a lot out of you? So the point about the e-bike is, you know, and, and, I mean something. You know, I mean, part of the reason why it was so funny is we didn't have the opportunity to charge them. So we knew we were going to run out at some point. The battery was going to run out. And halfway through the last day, my battery did run out. But the bike felt great to ride home without without the power, which I think is a really important point. But it just saved burning those matches on the 20 percenters getting out of those steep, tiny, wee, beautiful coves. <laughs> That's it. Catch with. Catch with. Yeah. Exactly how you say that. I'm not quite sure, but yeah. some of these coves you go down and honestly so tight, twisting down these little bends. But then you realize as soon as you get to the bottom, you've got to do the same thing straight up the other side. And that's where they were really useful. I think most of us had the e bikes turned off for most of the ride, apart from when you could see it ramping up in front of you and you'd be jabbing down between your legs onto the top tube trying to find this button <laughs> very quickly. Um, I think. Just as Rob said, if you had a normal bike, a mountain bike, gravel bike, whatever, it's not going to stop. You shouldn't let that stop you doing the route if you're a little bit anxious about the hills. They are really steep. And if I was on an analog bike, then, yeah, I'd definitely be walking some of them. So it would take a little bit longer, for sure. Um, not everybody has access to an e-bike, which probably costs quite a few thousand pounds. Um, it was a total joy for us, and we were really lucky to ride them, though. Um, and we can use the excuse of taking all the photographs of the guidebook, of course, uh, <laughs> why we needed a bit of extra oomph. And we would have still got round with, yeah, normal bikes, but it was really fun. Um, so potentially one to consider. And I know there'll be loads of places in Cornwall as well. If you don't have an e-bike but would like to try one, I'm sure there's lots of places where you could probably hire one. Oh, that's a good idea as well, actually. Um, and one of the reasons why I've been sort of wanting to drum the point about you guys doing it as a group and some of that experience, you got, you know how to cycle adventure routes on your own. And that's, that's a really unique and special challenge. Um, but what really blew me away after the launch of King Alfred's Way last year um, was the community that seems to have been around it and it's got a massive Facebook group now um, it's thriving it's full of stories it's full of people sharing advice and tips best place to you know like you said Catherine there might be a place where you can rent an e-bike or someone in the community could probably pop that in in a group chat um, and they've got one going as well for West Kerno Way so that should be going into the comments and you can click on that if anyone wants to join the Facebook group and do you feel like doing something like this whether you did it alone or in a group, but knowing that there's a community around you, you're able to share some of those special moments or you know, like some of that history that Guy was talking about as well. Being able to sit down and have a chat about it with someone that's surely got to be an extra part of the experience on something like this. Um, Rob. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, okay, so, you know, I mean, it, it kind of blew me away. So I'm from the Isle of Man, I grew up in the Isle of Man. So in a way, going to, you know, West Penwith or to Darkest Corn was kind of a bit of a homecoming. And, you know, the landscape looks vaguely similar and there are lots of similarities about it. And, you know, Guy, I thought Guy put it very eloquently. It, you know, it is so steeped in extraordinary history. And I think the fundamental point is that it's a part of Britain that just hasn't lost the authenticity of, of that landscape in the modern era, you know, in the modern farming era and, and, the, and the era of, you know, housing development. Uh, and, and so it just, you know, gets into your bones, you know, the, you know, the, the trees, the flowers, the, the, the wildlife, the historical buildings, you know the beautiful old byways and of course the fantastic seascapes and it, it you know really i mean i came away from it feeling like you know we'd had a few genuinely magical days yeah and some of that is summed up in a picture which is worth more than a thousand words as they say and that was part of what you were doing there getting some images um but also just to drum home that point as well bishop has said that yes you can hire e-bikes from saint ives so Proof in the pudding, communities here and helping everyone get out onto that route. Um, so, Catherine, you've picked out a picture from the route uh, that we're going to pop up onto the screen. 
and um, can you tell us a little bit about it and why you've picked these these photos? Yeah, um, I know I was supposed to just pick one, but I couldn't. <laughs> So the first one, I believe, was um, from our first day. Sophie mentioned the Tinner's Way before, and I think this was an extension of that footpath, which there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it hasn't always been a footpath and it can be upgraded. And it was just the most spectacular, remote feeling, gorgeous bit of single track riding that I've done in a long time. Um, again, going back to what Guy was saying about feeling really remote in these places we must have seen maybe just a couple of people all afternoon um and the second one is this little gorgeous orchid and rob will be able to back me up on this in that um i'm not much of a plants person usually i'm a zoologist by training so i'm really into animals but the flora in west cornwall was absolutely stunning because of because it's so much further south than the rest of the uk i think it might be subtropical um you just get all of these different plants that can't survive elsewhere. Um, I don't know specifically about the orchid, but you get so many different gorgeous pinks and purples and flowers and all sorts of, well, yeah. Rob was teaching me a lot of them and I've forgotten already, which shows you how good my memory <laughs> is. <laughs> but um, I just found that fascinating because when you're riding off road, you're going past so many hedgerows and on all of these cliff tops and moorlands and things. And you do notice things that you wouldn't usually see elsewhere. Um, I was really, really hoping to see a chuff, but alas, this trip was not the one, uh, oh, which is what? quite a rare uh, Corvid. You would have been chuffed if you saw one, wouldn't you? I would have been dead chuffed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, um, so they're quite rare, but they are found on the lizard. So I'm just going to have to go back and ride it again. What more excuse do you need? <laughs> um, and Guy, we've got a picture of yours coming onto the screen. Um, so can I... Mr. Guidebook Guy, uh, let's have a look at this one. What was this moment for you and why did you want to show it off? Well, this, A, it kind of talks to what I was saying about these little hidden gems. I mean, you're never going to go through this ford unless you do this route, I would imagine. And it's it's in the middle of the route. It's where, it's where you would otherwise think the route is kind of, it's away from the real highlight areas. And yet you're suddenly coming down this beautiful little metal road, farm road, it goes to cobbles, and then there's this incredible ford, and then you come up onto the uh, come up onto a, a gravel climb and then drop down into Cannonstown from there. But also I wanted to include it because it's an example of how the route is already evolving. Uh, because feedback from early riders was that the bridle path along the top of the ridge to Cannonstown, which what we'd originally put in from the map plot, when I rode it, I think my comment on the video is that uh, I did some YouTube videos as well if people want to watch those, is that Cornish horses obviously aren't very wide because if this is a Cornish bridle way, there's not a lot of space on it. And also, it doesn't drain very well. It's quite clay. So it's, it's quite hard riding, uh, even as a mountain biker. Uh, so chatting to Kieran and Sophie, we've agreed to bring the route up uh, on the road rather than crossing that first sort of claggy bit of the bridle path and then that not not only brings you to another fascinating uh, prehistoric monument uh, there's a massive hill fort just above this point as well where you can see both coasts and all the way up east cornwall west cornwall and uh, it just it, it shows how the route's evolving dynamically and just what incredible little gems there are hidden in this landscape so you know this in including this in the landscape has in in the route on the gpx file now if you download it now this is part of the official route uh, is how the route's evolving and how the feedback from the people riding it you know the people who are in the facebook comments is really helping develop and grow it's a very organic process this route it's not a right there's the flag in the ground that's it that's what you have to do you know the whole beauty of this route is it's a suggestion you know we we you know kieran's done an incredible job of creating this living organic route but you know it's like anything else you're it's fully open to your interpretation but this this you know i could have picked about 10 different pictures of my bike leaned up against this incredible ford that with this ancient big flagstone bridge next to it i mean who knows who's gone over that bridge in time it you know just the stories this little vignette of a picture could tell you could be amazing and but yeah i'm i'm rambling on it's very very easy to get lost in almost any point of this journey 
and this kind of encapsulated that for me. Oh, thanks, Guy. I love the enthusiasm, got to say, though. Uh, contagious. And um, if anyone wants to see any of Guy's videos as well, we've got a link to his video and that going into the comments as well. But next up, um, Vadangi, your picture. What did you choose and why? <laughs> um, actually, so obviously this photo doesn't quite represent the route in general. It just was a very happy moment for me. <laughs> so <laughs> I just thought it would be a good idea. Basically, this was on the last day of the trip and um, we were just out of, um, I actually don't know where it was, but it was towards the start of the day and we had just done a massive hill. And oh, this was just across the ferry actually, Helston Ferry. And um, yeah, we were just past the hill and I couldn't, I absolutely wouldn't shut up about how beautiful the fog was and how perfect the temperature was to ride in. And I suppose um, if you want to go deeper into it, it would probably also be like, yeah, Cornwall isn't always sunny, but even when it's not always sunny, it's so beautiful. Yeah. And yeah, riding there was an absolute joy. And I'm so glad Catherine took this picture because, yeah, like I don't always smile on my bike most of the times you would see me either being like super focused or just basically look grumpy for someone who really likes riding her bike I don't always smile uh, <laughs> so yeah I it was just a very happy moment so I thought nice. I would share that <laughs> well thank you thank you so much for doing so um I also just want to say um, Ali, you've asked a really good question there. We're going to come to that and we're going to have a quick Q&A at the end. And I think that's um, a very legitimate question. But let's get Catherine's photo up. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry. I meant Rob's. Well, that's mine. <laughs> that's sorry, my opinion. Um, so we, we didn't share these photos beforehand. So uh, I, I'm actually kind of making the same point as Guy. So this photograph was on day three, I think. Catherine and Vidangi, Vidangi might remember better than me. But just out of shot, sort of where I'm standing to take that picture, there's a well. And to, to get to that well, you walk through this you know, ancient bar of venerable hawthorn trees and, and and i'm a real tree hugger and i thought you know lots of parts of the route have fantastic treescapes which are you know really really valuable part of the whole experience but the well is what i just want to talk about so you know it, it, it's a really really unassuming holy well beside the route you know there are 200 holy wells in Cornwall and you add in to that you know the the, the Iron Age hill forts that Guy just mentioned and all the Celtic crosses many of which line the route of the West Kano Way and the Keels and the Hermit's Chapels and you have this incredible network of ancient life and one of the things that I really got from being on this route is you get this in certain places, you know, away from the major landmarks, you know, Senan Cove, Cape Cornwall, Land's End, St. Michael's Mount, where really, you know, they were teeming when we were there in June, um, you know, and the Helston River, very, very busy. But you get away from them and you get to this incredibly spiritual part of Cornwall really, really quickly. And you get this extraordinary sense of place in places like this ancient Hawthorne byway and beside this well, a sense of numinous, a sense of, you know, all the people who have visited that well over millennia. And that that is just something you don't get in so many parts of Britain anymore. And it's incredibly valuable. And it's something that draws me back to, to, to West Penwith in particular and, and the Lizard Peninsula again and again and again. Wonderful. Oh, that's really, really wonderful, Rob. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, a, a picture we've got coming up is uh, Sophie's Choice. Oh, <laughs> um, is Sophie's Choice from the race. So Sophie from Cycling UK, who helped make this route happen. <laughs> chosen this <laughs> epic, epic picture. What's this all about? <laughs> Sorry, that surprised me. I thought I'd picked a different picture, but I can talk about this one. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, it was just um, 
there are parts where it definitely feels like an adventure of which is yeah i think backs up guy's point about it's very difficult to say what the best bike is because there's so much variation in terrain and um yeah there are some bits that even though it had been very dry for a couple of weeks there because of the you know the dense foliage and the yeah just the, the type of ground underfoot there there are some parts where you still <laughs> feel like you're out in the wilds and have to take your bike for a walk so i think that's that's definitely a tip for this route whether it's going up a hill or whether it's some muddy bits or some rocky bits be prepared to take your bike for a walk occasionally i think that's a fair point isn't it because obviously you don't want to discourage anyone from doing this route but you want to be realistic about some of the challenges that that people might come up against um and this sort of thing is it common and what other challenges would you say that people would need to be aware of but I think this particular place uh, might be the one that Guy mentioned where actually we had a couple of you know, one or two local riders that said, oh, actually, if you want to avoid that wet bit, you could take it round here instead. So for one of the sections, we've, we've changed that part. But there are a couple of parts where there isn't really an alternative. So the wet bit is sort of unavoidable. Um, so yeah, there are, there, are, there are one or two short sections where it's like that. Um, there are there are a few quite rocky sort of fairly they feel quite technical on a gravel bike i felt like i you know for, for a few short little bits i thought oh i would be a bit more comfortable on the mountain bike here but you know you just kind of if you go slowly and take it carefully you can be all right and then uh yes if you choose to do the the sandbar at the loo then that's a definite push your bike across <laughs> you can't get you can't ride on that at all <laughs> Madangi is definitely agreeing now. Well, thank you for sharing that, Sophie, because I do think it is really important for people to know what they're getting themselves into. And, you know, and it is an adventure and it is a challenge. And surely, even though it's difficult sometimes, that's going to be part of the joy of succeeding and, and achieving it at the end as well, I'm sure. Um, just want to say bye to Emma, who wants to say good luck to everyone who cycles the route and maybe she'll see you along the route. And I really do hope that people watching. Um, we'll get in touch on the Facebook group and maybe cross paths with each other and meet each other because that's all that's just really awesome part of these sorts of routes and Ali your question there um, have there been any access issues with the locals experienced on the West Kernow Way so you know access 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 that is the big topic of these routes um, so Sophie you know from an official Cycling UK point of view have you come up against this sort of thing um, well, well, we, during the route development, um, we spent quite a lot of time talking to the kind of big land managing organisations or large parts that are man owned or managed by National Trust or Natural England or the Cornish Wildlife Trust. So, um, yeah, we had a lot of discussions there trying to find the most resilient route, kind of if it was an ecologically sensitive area, um, something like the Lizard National Nature Reserve, um, a really rare habitat. So we want to make sure that we're not having, you know, too, too much of an impact and we're choosing a route that's quite resilient. So, um, yeah, we had quite a few discussions there and managed to sort of work out a permissive access route. So the part across the Lizard Nature Reserve is actually marked on the map as a footpath. But the Natural Trust said, well, actually, this is quite a robust stony track and it's better than going on the bridal way um, because that's kind of a more sensitive area over there. So there are parts like that where we've kind of worked out things um there there will probably be one or two that emerge with local landowners because of the lost ways sort of thing um you know we have to kind of make sure we explain to people the reasoning behind that um and so yeah i think it'll be something that sort of develops and we'll see how it goes great and what about you recce route team how how was general reaction to you cycling it on the route? Um, and also, if anyone else has got any questions, please do get them in the comments. We've just got maybe a couple of minutes in which we'll be able to get to them. Um, but yes, yeah, so I just want to know how you felt locals responded to you being on the bike. I don't want to go, Catherine, but you're on mute. Yeah, I thought it was really, really positive. Um, I had a very similar, I think we had a very similar experience to what I typically experience in Devon, where I'm from. And a lot of locals are just really inquisitive and they see people with a bike with bags on and all loaded up and they're like, oh, where have you come from? Where are you off to? Everyone that we stopped to chat to was super friendly um, and really accommodating. And uh, even when we did the Helford crossing, taking the tiny little boat, we had to do two trips back and forth. Um, you know, it wasn't too much bother to take our bikes on the ferry we sort of 
it's a very small little boat and we jam them all in sort of all stacked on top of each other <laughs> um so yeah i thought everyone was yeah overwhelmingly friendly and in the cafes and things it was a real delight yeah like you say about the cafes there you know this sort of route is bringing extra tourism and especially after really difficult times when tourism hasn't been happening um surely there must be some benefits and this sort of route as well will be bringing off off season tourism so um local business owners i would imagine would be quite happy to see some mucky faces <laughs> yeah rob you're nodding away oh, yeah no i think that's right i mean I, and i think it's you know the the, the, the one of the underlying um you know principles of the whole initiative i think sophie uh and sophie will be able to confirm this was to do just that so you know it's to bring tourists during the shoulder months i mean i think you know you get a kind of dry december or these days february can be incredibly dry you know rainfall patterns are changing everywhere in britain in a very dramatic fashion so if you keep an eye on the weather for a couple of weeks and then you see a few days of sunshine bang straight down to Cornwall to ride the west kind of way so i think i think it will bring people you know all all, all through the the shoulder months and even through the winter we have one slightly cross word from a guy i think we cycled across his drive or something do you remember on day one uh for Danke? i mean you know and it, i mean it, it, it passed you know like that but generally speaking yeah loads of loads of enthusiasm for what we're doing yeah Oh, that's really great to hear. And um, Dave here, he's ridden it as well. He said, I rode it in mid-July and had no conflicts with locals. Loved it. Fantastic. Great. Great. That's what we love to hear. Cool. Um, right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for taking part today. You really have shared so much knowledge and insights as well as you know, heartwarming stories and history as well um, to Guy behind the scenes there as well. Don't forget, you can buy Guy's guidebook. Um, please do give the West Kerno Way a go. We'd love to hear about your experiences. Join the Facebook group, join Cycling UK, get involved with everything that's going on, um, and we're going to leave it there. Thank you, everybody. We say goodbye. <laughs>